guys are back with me? Yes? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, so, yes, uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's been a great week here already. Um, Scott and I have flown down um, to hack on some of our own stuff and then also, you know, just to spend some time surfing together and doing what we do at our company, I guess. Um, but you guys have all been, you know, more than, um, you know, hospital, uh, really nice, and it's just been just, you know, great experience so far. So, uh, thank you so much. So today I'm talking about, um, I'm not sure how to pr actually pronounce my talk because I've just kind of come up with it when I wrote it. Um, but I'll, I'll be talking about WordPress, obviously. Uh, that's what it's masking. Uh, but before I get to that, a little bit of background about who we are and what we do. Um, so we're human made. Uh, we're, and I'm, I guess I'm one of the partners um, at Human Made uh, with two other guys. We're 19 in total. Um, we are a company, we're a technology company primarily that's split between, um, you know, agency work. So as, um, as our two friends before mentioned, um, it's on one side we're doing a VIP enterprise work. Um, so we have, you know, fun, cl fun clients like Skype, um, Sony, Samsung, PayPal. All these kind of things that are on the enterprise side where we're really pushing the boundaries of what or how WordPress is used. Um, and, that, and that's really exciting. We also do a lot of code reviews for companies that already have um, existing WordPress teams. So we're always, we're always finding a, a good way to, to fit in there. Um, on the other side, I manage product. Um, and that's, that's Happy Tables for the, the large sort of component of it, which is a platform whereby restaurants can build and uh, manage their own websites. So that's really cool because it's, um, it's, it's something whereby we've used WordPress along the whole way, but you, you can't actually see it's WordPress, and I'll talk about that more later. Uh, we also have WP Remote, which is a platform whereby you can manage multiple WordPress sites at the same time. So you, I'm, I'm sure there's some users here. WP Remote, anybody? A few people? Cool, cool. That's great. Uh, it's actually free, so you just sign up if you want. Um, so back to our talk um, at hand. Uh, so WordPress is an incredible piece of software. You know, we've seen it grow over the years. Um, it, it's empowered millions to publish online, uh, build businesses around it, as we've you know, seen from Mark before, uh, and on a higher level, just move the web forward. Um, so there'll be WordCamp San Francisco in a few days, and you know, Matt will be talking about uh, the adoption rates of WordPress again. I'm sure it'll be around like 21 or 22 percent of the web that's WordPress, and that's that's a, that's a very large number to, to try and process. I, I still can't you know, get my head around it. Uh, and that's quite incredible. What's even more interesting is that with every year that passes and with every WordCamp that we attend, um, you know, WordPress is something that's being you know, pushed further down in the tech stack. So you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, JavaScript, we're seeing a lot of APIs on top of that. Um, and you know, with, with, all these, with all these technologies, um, where we're seeing less and less of WordPress. And it, 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 wasn't always, uh, it wasn't always that way. So years ago we had uh, WordPress by itself and that was more of a solution, right? Because it catered to blogging. It, it catered to a, a very specific action that we did. So it really felt like a solution, like an all-in-one product that we used. Uh, and times have changed now. You know, today when you look at WordPress, um, it doesn't make any assumption about who uses it and how to use it. Um, so it's not really a solution anymore. It's more of a, uh, of a back-end tool, right? So we've, we've migrated from solution to tool. But now, if it's a tool now, why are we still able to see if a, word, uh, if a website is built using WordPress? Isn't that strange? I mean, WordPress is 73% PHP, which is all server-side code. Why are we still you know, seeing WordPress? Um, it's, it's incredible because you, you, you see so many sites out there that are uh, still being influenced in their design and user experience by a product that's actually a back-end tool. And that's fundamentally wrong. And I'm not just talking about consuming content, you know, like on the front end of the website, but also creating content. And I think the future of WordPress um, is about how you can best use, use it to, um, or use it together with other technologies uh, in a way that the byproduct of it is that it renders WordPress completely invisible. And today I want to show you a, a couple of those ways um, that, you know, I've sort of the feelings I've had over the last couple of years, trying to sum up some of the things I've seen um, and sort of make a few, I guess, predictions of where we're going. 
Um, so the first thing I like to talk about is consuming content. And that's really the front end of your website, right? That's, that's what's being output. Um, that's what most people traditionally build. They build a theme, um, and this is what's being output. Um, and I think there's a lot of like bad habits kind of going around. And they're not really, I mean, they're, yeah, they're bad habits. I, I guess they're not even trends in, in any way, but they're just things that we're not seeing, but we're doing somehow. And things that I've all been guilty of. So um, maybe you'll see a couple of your own sort of uh, things in that too. The first one I'd like to talk about is default settings. Um, a friend of mine who runs a hotel um, had, you know, he contracted a small agency um, not too long ago to create a website for him, uh, for his hotel. And like, you know, most hotel websites, you have this page which sort of, you know, lists what kind of rooms they have. And this is like an overview page. So every, uh, every item, every hotel room links out to a, a more detailed page. So, you know, we're thinking custom post types, uh, pretty straightforward stuff. The only, the only interesting thing is when they ship the website, it said read more. <laughs> read more doesn't make sense. It's, it's not what, that's, that's just the, the default copy. So it's not, a, it's not a case of someone adding text and sort of creating a, a website, it's someone leaving default settings in and not even noticing it. Um, and, that's, and that's crazy because how a, a website is written is just as important as the design. Right, your copy can't fail in any way there. So when you're creating a website using WordPress, it's so important to, to have text that reflects the goals of the actual website and not just decent values, um, default values. So another great example of that is, you know, let's say you add a widget uh, for like the, your recent sort of news on a website. It says recent posts. Are you changing that text to actually reflect recent news or recent articles or something else? Or are you just leaving in recent posts. Um, you know, and these are, these are really the, these sort of things that at the beginning that I didn't even think about, but I was still making that mistake. Um, another one that's, that it took me, you know, a, a long, long time to realize was uh, theme templates. And when I'm talking about that, one of the, the sort of obvious culprits is a sidebar of PHP. Does anybody actually know what sidebar.php is for? <laughs> what purpose does it serve? Does it serve a purpose? Because it's a, it indicates a, a sort of visual name, right? It's, it's saying you have a sidebar, but you don't need it. You need a header, you need a footer, you need your content area, but you don't need a sidebar. So why, why, why is sidebar.php being shipped with WordPress? I mean, it's not a big deal, but the outcome of that is that we may, you know, subconsciously say, oh, I need to build a sidebar for my website. You know, I've certainly done it. Um, and it's silly, right? So you you see plenty of themes, you see plenty of like client websites, um, and they all have a sidebar. And to make matters worse, you know, you throw in your widgets, your tags, and all that kind of stuff. And you're, you're really sort of just buying into how the tool was shipped as opposed to what the website actually needs, what your client needs. And that's something that's, again, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you don't have to be doing by, on purpose, but just by, you know, building a website, uh, maybe you're, you know, taking a, a few shortcuts or you're cutting a few corners on time because the budget's bad or whatever, but then you leave things like that in there, and it's kind of weird. I think there's other files like that, like comments template. Um, you know, you, you go on like a small business website, there's an about page, but somehow it still has like the, the comments tag in there. So all the, the comments or people are like, trying to contact the business through comments form. It's really weird. Um, you know, it's, it's really awkward. Uh, another great one is get blog info. So you know the, the, the tagline um, that you have for your website. So a lot of people feel inclined to have to have a tagline for their website under the name. I, I think that's awkward too. You, you don't need it. Um, and I think one of the important lessons here is that even if you even if you don't use every template or function or file or whatever, is that it doesn't make your website any less WordPress, right? I think the, the largest compliment you can uh, pay to WordPress is to really only use what you need and then to leave everything else aside, right? Because as I said before, WordPress is a tool. It's not the full solution. So only take what you need. Uh, and that leads me to our next point, um, that you know, WordPress is or WordPress or heavy premium themes or let's say like Twitter Bootstrap, 
um, are so large and they come with so many like um, actual sort of UI patterns and code and just general sort of weight that you know in, you may subconsciously be buying into some of the design decisions. And I, you know, again, that's one of those things that you may not even notice you're doing. Um, and I think that's the wrong starting point for a lot of effective design. So when I ever create a website, I always start from scratch. So for WordPress, that means using <coughs> that means using underscores, you know, as a as a sort of starting place because I don't want to start with a, a much heavier, larger um, starting point because that again makes me buy into that kind of stuff, which I don't want to do. So let's talk about that some more. Um, who's created a website recently? No shit. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, out of, out of all you people, um, how many of those had, let's say, a slider? Okay, that's a lot. Um, <clears throat> so, one of my sort of pet peeves with sliders is that you have your website, which is, you know, quite long, vertical, and then you have the slider, you know, which is trying to take up all this other space. Um, you know, it's, it's hiding this, it's hiding this sort of HTML, if you want, right? It's hiding all these images. Your website's 960 pixels wide, but then your slider's like 4,000 pixels. So it doesn't make sense. So this guy obviously can't get through because, you know, the shit's too big. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. And I think that's a, that's a real issue that we have in, in our community is that the premium ecosystem promotes the, this, this sort of standard that sliders are good, right? Because premium themes want to ship of everything, short code, sliders, parallax, whatever else, you know, you, you can find out there because, you know, their whole premise is let's ship with as many things as possible and then the client will take what they need. But everything ships with um, sliders. You know, you look at like theme forest, the top 100, 100 themes all have sliders. Um, I, f I forgot what the name was on Mark's slide um, from Envato's annual report for number three in the top selling plugin. It was a uh, super sexy slider or something, what was it called? It was something like that. Uh, you know, again, something that, that you know, you think is like this, this massive like plugin that has all these like slider options and, you know, stuff that you probably don't need. Now, there's, there's bad news to all this. Um, what's the click-through click rate on sliders? Does anybody know? Uh, let's try 1%. Uh, so that's according to a, a, a study conducted by Notre Dame University not all too long ago. Now what's even more interesting is that out of, out of that 1%, 80% of the clicks are happening on the first slide. So you remember the dog with the stick, you know, stuff that you don't see. People don't see it either. They don't want to click on it. Um, so what that leaves you is that with something, if you have a slide in like position five, you know, the click-through rate is going to be 0.03%. You know what else has that sort of probability? The chance of you getting struck by lightning once in your lifetime. That's according to National Geographic, so I'm not questioning it. But, you know, this brings us back to how uh, users, uh, or how your website users um, consume content. And the question here is, are the websites that you're designing and creating uh, being influenced by software, such as WordPress, uh, or the community around it? You know, so on the community side, we have things like the sliders, we have parallax effect, whatever. Uh, that's, that are being pushed through. And then on WordPress, we have those default settings. We have these template uh, file names that, you know, throw us off or try to force us down a funnel, which we don't need to be a part of because WordPress is a tool. Um, so, you know, question those sort of things next time you create a website. Uh, you might actually save time. So we talked a bit about consuming content uh, through WordPress, but let's talk about um, creating content. And that's the other side. It's something that a lot of people don't deal with on a regular basis because it's, it's something that requires quite a bit of an investment in terms of time. But I think for anybody working in WordPress, it's important to sort of experiment with this sort of stuff. So WordPress um, at its core is about writing. Um, but if WordPress has become a tool, how has that you know, changed 
the way we write, the way we create content through WordPress, the most sort of basic content, writing a post or a page. So we may have already spent hours, you know, explaining to our clients um, how their front end works and how their website works and why we've designed it in a certain way or why we've done, um, we've executed uh, a certain things in the, you know, the manner we did. Um, but then we, we log them into the, you know, the admin area and it looks like a spaceship, right? It's got all this shit on the left, above, to the right. Um, you know, there's multiple navigations. It's confusing. I find it confusing. Um, and what's, you know, what's quite an, you know, sort of um, the, the large sort of contrast I see on a, on a like weekly basis is whenever I log into medium.com for writing, <coughs> losing my voice, sorry. Um, and this is a beautiful writing experience. You know, I really want to just start writing and medium has that sort of uh, great feel to it, but we don't have that in WordPress and that's okay. WordPress is a tool. It assumes, um, it, it tries to cater to everybody in the world. And in doing so, it caters to nobody, right? So we sort of have this, this opportunity to create different interfaces for people to interact or create content with WordPress. Uh, one of those is, one of those is FrontKit. Um, and that's a tool developed by my friend Adrian back in Switzerland who just uh, demoed this at WordCamp Europe. I'll let you have a look. So this is all being created on the fly, which is pretty incredible. Um, there's, there's pretty much minimal UI, right? You're, you're really just editing on the website with as little UI as possible. And this is all creating semantic HTML. So there's not any sort of weird custom post type going on or anything. And things like this make me want to write content. You know, I, I don't want to go in the WordPress admin, write some content, click save, then go and preview, uh, realize it's wrong, come back, you know, change some text, click save or update, um, go and preview again. Um, it's just the wrong sort of flow. In this kind of situation, it's, it's really what you see is what you get. It's not the sort of tiny MCE uh, uh, version of that. Because what, what you see in a tiny MCE is not a reflection of you know, the formatting and the style you have on your website. Um, I'll definitely tweet the link later so you guys can sign up if you want to. Uh, I, it's going to be open source and I, I'll sure, I'm sure it'll be quite fun to play with because for small business websites, I think you might actually get away with installing something like this. Um, so not just you know not just front kit. I think uh, WordPress itself is shipping with a front end editor on 4.1. Um, I haven't seen it. It's it's already available if you you know you get the the nightly build um, to have a look at. But it's um, I think it's very interesting because it, ch it changes the game quite a lot. If we don't have to if if we remove WP admin from users entirely, and they only have this front-end editor. So after we, you know, we, you go past writing, there's also managing content, right? You're talking about not just uh, single posts or pages, but also maybe, um, you know, custom post types where you have, uh, you know, books, movies, whatever you want to do. Um, you know, let's say you have a menu for your business, you know, if you're a uh, hair salon or a restaurant or whatever, you may use custom post types to uh, express data in a more structured manner. And what's interesting here is when you register a custom post type, there's really nothing custom about it, right? Because you get this list on the back end, um, the same way you do for posts. Uh, and that's fine, right? Because it's completely uh, unstyled. It makes no assumption again about who's using it. But then you get the same screen again, and you know, it's something that doesn't really cater to uh, what you may be trying to build. So I think here again it's interesting because you can take these same fields and expose them on the front end without ever, you know, having the user come on uh, on the back end. So what if we just remove WP admin from the mix, you know, and we just put that on our front end uh, theme? 
And that's something that's possible, you know, with a few functions. It's not, it's not something that's, it's not rocket science, it's not crazy, you don't have to be an excellent PHP developer. Um, you can just make use of a few, you know, standard WordPress functions, such as creating a post, updating a post, and then uh, deleting a post. Uh, and that just uses HTML forms. So, you know, again, you have a lot of power to try and change the way people manage their content but we're so used to how WordPress is, is designed that we've just bought into all the ways and the user experiences of it, which is, again, not necessarily right if it's just a tool. Um, so last but not least, once we've kind of graduated past managing content, um, one of the things we can do is start creating web applications whereby you know, WordPress is completely gone. It transforms into something completely different. And to me, that was, those are the most interesting uses of WordPress because you're really pushing the boundaries of it in, in the way it's used as a solution, right? Because you're creating completely custom solutions on top of it, um, like we've done with Happy Tables. So now, like, these new are like, shit, you know, custom dashboard coming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is Happy Tables. So Happy Tables is, you know, I showed it to you guys before, um, or I mentioned it before, is a platform whereby restaurants can create and manage their own websites. They have no clue that WordPress is happening here. You know, was, uh, they start typing in their, the restaurant name, that hits up the Google Places API, uh, the autocomplete API, so we automatically find a restaurant, we automatically grab their data, we cross-reference that with Foursquare, pull in more data, pull in some images, and then spawn a website that, you know, has a lot of their content already in there. But the entire dashboard is not WordPress. This is actually a WordPress theme. So we're running a few themes, but the client never goes to the WP admin. They never go to WordPress admin. And this only really becomes real if I show you, you know, if the debug bar, on, or I mean the admin bar on top. And in this case, what we're doing is we're simply communicating um, this theme is communicating through, um, you know, a REST API back to WordPress. And the way that data is visualized on here is using uh, knockout.js, you know, similar to Backbone. So, you know, this has enabled to do, us to do a lot of things, like, let's say, pages. It doesn't have to be complicated. If they click on uh, edit page here, um, it might just, you know, open up a little text box right there. They're not actually going to go onto a separate page. Um, and, you know, these are things that are very powerful and much more easy to understand for someone that's not a technical user. Oops. Going back, sorry. Uh, food menus, you know, custom post type. But it's all structured in a term, in a way that makes sense to the end user. Um, so it's not something whereby, you know, you have that default view of like 10 posts on each page and you're, you know, paginating through um, you know, to find your individual food item. Uh, you know, this is something that's structured in a way that makes sense. Um, again, like the gallery, that could be a custom post type. In our case, it is. But what's interesting is, like, if it was a custom post type in WordPress admin without any styling, you'd be looking at text as opposed to images in the list view. Here, you're just dropping images in, and it's uploaded. And the cool thing is it also allows us to create completely new functionality, like, you know, the newsletter function, uh, which is quite separate to what WordPress does. So again, we're, you know, we're able to tie a lot of things together in a way that makes sense from a user experience point of view. And, you know, like I said before, this is something that's, you know, built through, you know, we have Knockout.js on top, or you can use Backbone, uh, and then that, you know, shoots through the REST API. Um, now, we built our own one. Uh, WordPress is having a REST API that's going to ship pretty soon um, with it. So you can use that or create your own. Um, and then that just feeds back to WordPress. Now, what's pretty cool about all this is that this was more of a mind block for us to create this. It was more that we we're so ingrained into WordPress way of doing things that we didn't really, it wasn't really a resor uh, resource thing because it took it took Joe and I a week to create this in terms of like the, the back end platform. 
uh, or dashboard, uh, the first iteration of it. Um, so I was just doing all the design, all the HTML, uh, a lot of the interactions. He was doing all the back-end code. And then we, you know, we had a first version after five days. Um, that was, you know, it, it was incredibly fast because we're only loading the things we needed to. Uh, it just worked so much faster than the regular WP admin. And we had full control over it. You know, in that time, in that one week's time, what could have you done? What could you have done with like the WordPress admin in terms of customizing it? Um, probably not a lot because it already takes so much to remove everything you don't need from admin uh, to actually start building things you do need. So, starting from starting with an entirely new theme and then using this the sort of uh, API to connect to it makes a lot more sense. It's also a much faster way to work because now we don't have to deal with WordPress updates or certain style um, changes or anything to WordPress admin because it's not part of our flow. We also haven't hacked WordPress in any way. These are all using very standardized ways of WordPress if you want. So what's interesting is that uh, Matt Mullenweg, you know, co-founder of WordPress, um, a few weeks back at WordCamp Europe said um, one of the things he saw more of or what he thought was gonna ha there was going to be more in the, in the community of is uh, custom dashboards. Um, so that was exactly what I just showed you guys now. And I think that goes back to the larger point that WordPress is being um, buried deeper in the stack, you know, really at reinforcing the fact that it's a tool. Um, so the whole point of what I've showed you in the last 20 minutes isn't to knock WordPress uh, down or make it sound inferior in any way. Uh, I think it's quite the contrary. It's about making WordPress a core component of your website without compromising design or user experience. And, you know, the, I, I, I guess the, the, the summary of this is that the future of WordPress uh, is about creating solutions whereby the end product is invisible. You know, for, for WordPress itself, where you, the user has absolutely no um, sense or idea that WordPress has been used because it's been used so effectively. Thank you. Awesome. Any questions? All right. Well, watch out. Just a question about happy tables. I yeah. want to know um, when the guys uh, enter in their restaurant and you grab the information from Foursquare, etc. How do you validate that they are legitimately the owners of that restaurant? Why does it matter? Um, well, if it's, for example, like the property business, uh, we built a sort of almost like the happy tables thing with one click install. Uh, competitors from other property companies would register the, for their competitor and um, put up fake listings and all that type of stuff. Yeah, so that's a fair point. Um, we actually don't validate that. Uh, we ha we've never had a, a request, you know, like a takedown request in, in that fashion. Um, the closest we've come to that is where um, business partners of the same restaurant had a disagreement, divorce, and then, you know, one wants to take the website or take down the website or whatever. Um, so by default, when a, when a, a client uh, or any user registers a site, um, the, the whole sort of uh, no index stuff is on. So nothing's getting indexed till the domain is actually connected. Uh, so it'd be kind of a costly initiative to uh, go down that route. And if I, get, I guess if you're really trying to hurt your competitors, um, you'd probably not use happy tables because then they'd have your, you know, your competitors or your, the ones you're trying to take down would have a nice website, you know, which is kind of contrary to what you're trying to achieve. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, so you said you used Knockout JS. Um, I was wondering why you chose uh, Knockout as opposed to something like Backbone that's in core or something like Angular JS. Um, yeah, fair question. I'm so I'm not the lead developer on this or developer at all. Um, but I think the the sort of initial attraction was we we're just looking for a library because we're sort of you know, making our first steps with this sort of application. Um, you know, just creating an application like that in terms of a dashboard. 
Um, and Knockout just seemed something, it just seemed to fit our purpose without any sort of additional baggage. Um, so that worked well for us. But then like when you look at WP Remote, that's something where we've used uh, Backbone. Um, so I'm not sure, it was, just, it was probably just because Knockout was something that looked very easy to integrate. And it was in the end, you know, because we said on Monday, we're going to ship this thing by Friday. So whatever way we could make that happen was how we picked a Knockout. <laughs> Cool, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Cool, any more questions? Questions, questions? Okay. You are pretty slow for an old man. Uh, so I'm going to be that guy, and I'm going to ask the question that I'm probably going to get stabbed in the back for. What are your feelings, like WordPress has come a long way, but what do you feel about Joomla? <laughs> uh, it's no backstab. Um, um, I don't know, I, I, I wouldn't be qualified to answer that. Um, I, I, I tried Joomla out, um, you know, years ago, and it just, it just didn't feel right in terms of user experience. What I was looking for, um, I couldn't find enough use cases for the things I was trying to achieve. Um, WordPress was doing that. I mean, you know, Mark showed in his presentation before is what, like 33,000 plugins uh, in the repository. So there's a lot of use cases that are already being solved. Um, there's also a massive community around it, right? So you can find a, an active meetup group almost anywhere. So it, it's very easy to partake in WordPress and then be part of that um, and just simply grow with it. I mean, ultimately, WordPress is just a bunch of PHP. Uh, what makes it great is the community and how people have solved things in the past not just the product itself. So, ultimately, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, probably, I'm, I'm really not the best one to answer that because I, you know, my best experience of CMSs before that was PHP Nuke or whatever in like 2001. So, um, you know, this works, you know, this, this works for us. Uh, it works for us as an agency. Uh, it works for us as a product company and on a higher level as a technology company. So if you know, WordPress was ever to involve into something else or to change you know, its sort of whatever current form it has now, we would move with that. Um, so we're, we're certainly not um, stuck on WordPress um, by itself. We're rather stuck on the, the people that make the community, um, the people around us, um, and you know, just the general sort of momentum of what sort of technologies are coming out today. Uh, and Joomla just doesn't seem to be part of that. So, you know, that's the best I can give you. Cool. Hey, I suppose it's a bit of a bigger question, but how do you balance the agency and product development? What's yeah, your strategy handling that? Good question. Um, that's a very good question. So I, I, I think it's, I think it really depends on what kind of company you want to build. Um, so you first have to figure that out. You know, if you're looking for pure cash flow or uh, you're trying to create a product, you know, you, you know, there's different ways to go about things. You can raise money. Uh, you can focus purely on, um, you know, enterprise sales or whatever. We're more of a lifestyle company, a technology company, so we like to experiment a lot. We like to play with stuff. We like to hack around. Um, and that takes us in both directions, right? Because on the enterprise side, we have the ability to you know, really push our skills um, to the limit with the requirements of certain clients. Um, you know, like, let's say, migrating the Skype logs together or, you know, creating a, an entire different uh, editorial flow for a large publishing company. That really pushes um, or tests us uh, in ways that we would not come up with otherwise ourselves. But then on, this, on the product side, we're able to really pursue things that we're passionate about. Um, so, you know, in a way, maintain a narrative or uh, the story of, you know, what kind of company we want to be. Now, how we actually balance that, um, I, I guess we're very successful on the agency side. I mean, we're, we're, at, we're pretty much at the top of our game uh, in that regard, so we're, we're able to charge a, a significant amount. And in that form, you know, the, there's a lot of cash flow that's being created for the product side, uh, even if the product side is being more and more successful. Follow-up question? I'll ask you, 
Scott, how much do we charge? Do you charge in days or weeks? It's, it's on the website, isn't it? Were we 350 pounds an hour? Dollars an hour? It's one of the two. Yeah. It's, it's, it's about 1800 a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> Other questions? Don't be shy. Oh, no, here. Sorry if I'm losing my voice. Um, we know WordPress is very flexible, but have you found any situations where it wasn't the answer, where you even thought maybe it could work and something maybe restricted you from not working, from it not working? So I haven't seen it, um, and that's not to say it doesn't exist. I think it's because, and, and this, 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 shoots, this, this comes full circle back to my talk in the sense that WordPress is being very deeper in the stack, so it's, it's really only fulfilling the things it's good at. So we're not really ever trying to use it for things where it doesn't fit. So for everything we've done so far, it's worked out really well. Um, I don't think we've created a single application or hack or anything on the side where we didn't use it. So I, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really about using it for what it's strong for. Um, but there's so many other great technologies now that, I mean, any given project's mixing so many like pretty like large part uh, you know like libraries such as Backbone. I mean that's a massive project, and then combining that with something like WordPress is is, is incredibly powerful. So, yeah, no worries. Cool. Any other questions? Hey, hey. Um. So with regards to education, I would like to know. Um, do you think? Educating underprivileged youth, that this would fast track the process on this visual tools, would it fast track the process or would it sort of take away the fundamental knowledge of developing a site or coding and those type of things? If I understand correctly, um, because I'm stating that WordPress is becoming more of a tool, um, you're, you're asking me if it's becoming sort of less visually exciting for, for people to learn? Well, the visual tools help. Like those text blocks, would it help on yeah. sort of people who won't have access to, to the education or those type of things? Um, would it help? Would it fast track the process, or do you think it's taking away that the fundamental understanding of coding and developing principles? Um, because we're creating such a because we're creating because we're creating such strong user experiences that you you're not coding anymore. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, I mean that's 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 two that's two sides of the coin, right? I mean, like on one side, you if if I mean user experiences are something that are becoming intrinsically better uh, day by day across every single um, platform or medium. You know, I mean, you look at an iPhone today compared to an iPhone five years ago; it's it's worlds apart. Um, you're looking at something like uh, Google Material Design and sort of the interactions or the libraries or the patterns they're promoting. Those, those are things that are, you know, light years ahead of anything that WordPress has ever released in terms of UI or user experience. Um, so, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not worried about that per se. I think that's the, the, the sort of natural um, evolution of, you know, what we work in today, that micro interactions are becoming something that's so much more important uh, of our day to day. Um, no, I'm not worried. Uh, for, for lack of a better term. Cool. Anyone else got a question? I'm on my way. That user experience that you created for Happy Tables. Yes. Would you and have you done that for other type of clients like? Corporate clients, um, for example, a lot of our clients want me to, to help them. Some of the design stuff of our developers developing WordPress websites. So the back end, as you know, looks like the dashboard and it's quite complicated for a non tech to understand that. So something like this is really user friendly for people, but um, we don't develop that way. That's so is that something that I should offer clients from a corporate perspective? Because um, this works very well for your happy tables. 
can you do it for other type of websites? I mean, I think if, you're, if, if the project is only less than 100 grand, n uh, you shouldn't do it. Um, Sorry? I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry. If the project is only less than 100,000 um, US dollars, you probably shouldn't do that because there's this massive investment that goes into something like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, what's, what's, what, is, what is interesting, however, is that when you take um, you know, something like this, and you're saying that, you know, this is complicated, and it is for a lot of people, but there's so much you can do in terms of um, just adding in a, a, a few actions or, um, yeah, a few actions, actually, to or hooks to, to sort of undo a lot of the things that are here. So you can hide a, a lot of what is here. Um, you know, but let's say you have um, someone that's just updating their small business website and that's all they ever do. But because they have access to all of this stuff, they're gonna, they're gonna break shit. Like that's, you know, it's yeah, just, it's just gonna happen. Absolutely. So what you do is you give, them a user, you, give, you give them a user role, which is something like an author, right? Um, so you're already stripping away tons of their stuff. Um, you know, then you're, you're maybe, hiding the dashboard from them and you're redirecting that to a, to a simple page which is like how to use WordPress you know as opposed to showing them stats like how many pages they have or how many comments they have because that's not going to change over the next five years um, so I mean and there's a lot of things you can hide in, in these you know in these places to the point that you're actually creating a really good strong user experience because you've removed everything they don't need so you've created a funnel uh, in terms of they're only going into places that makes sense. Yeah. You know, that's the next logical step. You know, so that they land on the WordPress admin, they're like, okay, all I see is dashboard. Uh, or maybe they don't even see dashboard. They just see posts um, and user settings. You can do that. Yeah. That is no issue whatsoever. And that would probably take you a few hours to, to figure out the first time um, you package that as a plugin for yourself and you just apply it to all your other clients. Sorry? I said they do tend to go in and kind of get a bit confused and mess things up sometimes. Yeah, and then but it takes your time up. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Okay. And then that dilutes your hourly rate, which is no fun. Awesome. Let's get up and all.